Good morning, everyone, and uh, a very warm welcome to all the journalists connected to this uh, live stream, as well as to those that are now connecting here in this environment. We are here now today for the uh, uh, Sentinel 2C pre launch press briefing. The latest satellite in Europe's Copernicus program, Sentinel 2C, is set for launch on the last Vega rocket liftoff from Europe's spaceport in French Guiana. On 3 September this year at 10:50 uh, local time at night, which would bring us uh, here in Europe to 4 September 3:50 at night, and I am very pleased to have with me today for this uh, pre-launch media briefing four speakers that will give you a short introduction, followed by a Q&A session. If later on you would like to have some questions answered, please feel free to put them in the chat you find here within the environment, and when we will address you um, on the order of you raising the questions. With me today, I have Simonetta Kelly, Director of Earth Observation Programs at ESA, followed by Marco Facchini, who is the head of the unit for Earth Observation at the European Commission. Then we have Stefan Israel, from CEO, who is CEO at Ariane Spass, and Tony Trocker nielsen Director of Space Transportation at the European Space Agency. And with this, I would like to give the word to Simonetta Kelly. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you, Nina. Good morning to everybody for this press briefing for the launch of uh, Sentinel-2C. Uh, I'd really like to uh, say hello to the journalists that we're getting ready for the launch next week. Uh, and I have a few uh, slides that I will uh, display to introduce the, the, the Sentinel satellite. If those could be displayed, it would be great. So we have uh, a Copernicus program that's uh, basically a, a great success story of, of Europe overall. It's a program which is led by the European Commission. You'll hear all about it from the next speaker um, from the Commission, from Mauro. But in that context of 25 years of collaboration, uh, between ESA and the Commission, the European Space Agency has been uh, organizing the, the space component and coordinating the space component of this program. So if you go to the next slide, basically we see what's the role of the agency in that context. It's uh, to develop the satellites together with the support of European space industry. It's to operate those satellites together with UMETSAT and also to organize uh, the data package in support of the various Copernicus service. Uh, today, we have seven uh, first-generation satellites uh, uh, to, uh, already in operation. They're well-functioning. The first uh, launch of uh, Copernicus was in uh, 2014 with Sentinel-1A launched. And since, we have a variety of satellites of those Sentinel family of uh, Sentinel-1, Sentinel-2, 3, uh, 5P, and 6 uh, that were launched. Uh, seven out of the eight are fully operational uh, today, and we look forward to launch Sentinel-2C next week. If we go to the next slide, we see uh, what are the features of Sentinel-2C. It's, in fact, uh, in, a, in a nutshell, a mission that's uh, a mission with an optical uh, sensor. So an optical sensor that has... Uh, 13 uh, bands, and those 13 bands have different spatial resolution. You have six bands at 10 meter resolution, three at 20 meter resolution, six at 20 meter resolution, and uh, three at 60 meter resolution. So overall, a resolution of the satellite of about 10, minute, 10 meters and a five day revisit time. And this is allowed by the fact that you have two satellites up in operation, and that's why it's so important to launch next week, Sentinel-2C, which will, in fact, once commissioned, uh, three months commissioning, replace the Sentinel-2A uh, 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 and will grant that uh, revisit periodicity that is done to Sentinel-2. It's important, this Sentinel uh, satellite, the two, it's an optical mission that was conceived initially to support uh, requirements which were coming from the land and uh, I would say mostly what is related to forest, agriculture and land activities, but has provided very much uh, beyond its initial objective, a lot of results also in areas like uh, uh, oceans, bathymetry and methane. It's uh, those uh, 13 spectral bands are, are very important in the sense that today we're also building the next generation of uh, Sentinel-2, 
We're going to submit the decisions related to Sentinel-2 next generation to the ESA Ministerial Council next year in October. And that Sentinel-2 next generation will, will be the longer term continuity mission. It's a mission that will enhance both in terms of spatial resolution passing from about 10 meter to 5 meter and also in terms of uh, spectral bands. The SWAT of uh, Sentinel-2 is about 294 kilometers. And what is also important to mention here is that it's been built by a consortium of companies, over 60 companies that was led and has been led by Albert Defense and Space Germany. So you see a very strong collaboration in terms of industrial collaboration and institutional one. And last but not least, the data of Copernicus are distributed based on a free and open data policy, which means those data are free, uh, available for those users, institutional users, but also commercial users and also science users. If we go to the next slide, we see the present and future. So to give you a perspective, what is important with the Sentinel system and for 2C as well is the continuity of data in terms of providing data to the users. And that's why we have a third model today of that Sentinel-2C uh, plan to be launched in terms of uh, requirements from the users. Those are collected by the Commission, but uh, in terms of continuity of data, it's really important to have stable, continuous data provision to those users, and in particular, as I said, in areas of application like uh, deforestation and land. And we have a 2D uh, planned launch at uh, in uh, late 28, and as I said, uh, the next generation of Sentinel-2, which is foreseen after a decision and funding granted by member states uh, of visa and the commission uh, um, in the early uh, next, uh, in the early, I mean, in 2032. If we go to the last slide, I'd like to mention what I just said, that the, the satellite uh, data use has been extremely uh, positive in terms of the success story, not just in terms of uh, variety of application in which the data have been used. You see here the area of agriculture and food security. And as I said, land was the initial really application area for which uh, it was conceived as satellite. Today, food security is part of the societal development challenges. Agriculture is certainly a very important domain in which we work, but not only that, also forestry and deforestation monitoring. Accurate uh, burnt areas is another example, which is also helping the monitoring and implementation of relevant uh, legislation. But uh, uh, just to mention areas which were not initially expected to be uh, useful in terms of application, which have been extremely useful, abatimetry in the area of the motion and detection of ocean, and also the methane monitoring, where there is a very strong international initiative, the email initiative, uh, where methane monitoring emitters are somehow detected also via Sentinel-2, and that's certainly a very strong and relevant area also of legislation. I'm sure Mauro will mention about that. So this is, in a nutshell, uh, this uh, satellite, and we look forward to the launch next week. I must say, uh, over all these years, and also the preparation of the campaign, we had extremely good collaboration with all the actors. Uh, the Commission in premise, but not only, the industry, I'd like also to thank. And of course, uh, with uh, Ariane Spass, uh, Avio, and all the uh, launcher providers during the... Thanks a lot to all, and I'm available for questions. I'd like to pass the floor to Mauro Facchini, who is the head of the unit for Earth Observation in the European Commission in DigiDefis, and really the closest partner on this mission in terms of collaboration. Thanks a lot, Mauro, to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Simonetta, first of all, you, can you confirm you can hear me well? Yes, I see that you are. So, yes. So, it's, uh, so welcome to all the participants, journalists, and so on, and to the good friends I see online, with whom I cooperate practically on a, on a daily basis. Uh, uh, my role as European Commission is mostly to speak about, about Copernicus and what is the importance of Sentinel to see to this program. So European Commission, as been mentioned by, um, by Simonetta, is the, the manager of, uh, of the program, of the Copernicus. And Copernicus is one of the, is the Earth observation component of a broader European space program that is already including also Galileo, Agnos, and uh, something about Iris Square for the future, and so on. When we speak about Copernicus, we are more probably speaking, speaking about uh, the most complete and successful 
first observation program in the world. We are not saying that. I think all the people are saying that, and we are very proud. That we are very proud of uh, of that. And uh, <clears throat> it's a program that is not just addressing satellites, but the full chain, meaning from the satellites that are launched, and also to the services that can be generated to the benefit of uh, of the users. And also to a part of this downstream, the downstream market uptake, where also the data that are generated by Copernicus can be taken up, take, taken up by different communities of users, but also by uh, the uh, sm small and medium enterprise and so on to develop some of their own uh, capacities in uh, where where needed. It's uh, a true European success that is including several party parties. Uh, Indeed, the European Commission has mentioned, but also cooperating with ESA, UMATS, in, in both of them for the for the for the for the um, operation of the space component. ESA being really behind the design architect of the space of the space component, uh, but also several European and uh, in, international European agencies uh, dealing with the surfaces them, themselves, uh, ranging from European Environment Agency to the uh, to ECMWF and many other that are really. Uh, providing uh, with a lot of success the Copernicus service. I would also like to mention USPA, so the EU Space <clears throat> Program Agency that is also looking mostly behind uh, market uptake of the Copernicus program. Coming to today, indeed, uh, I think uh, uh, beyond thanking uh, European Space Agencies, as I said before, I would also like to, to thank Ariane Spas uh, as a partner for launching uh, our Sentinel satellites in the past, today and in the future and industry uh, that has been behind also the construction of uh, these uh, very high level uh, very high level satellites so getting into detail about sentinel 2 indeed i will not go to the to the deep details of uh, simonetta the technical details but just to mention that sentinel 2c that will be launched next week uh, uh, will keep the constellation of sentinel 2 operational there are already two satellites flying but actually they are aging so it's very important to to launch a new satellite before uh, the other uh, are aging too much. And uh, it's a very important constellation. It's, it's also considered retro missions for many optical missions that are flying around the world. Uh, Sentinel-2 satellites are used in many applications, as mentioned again by Simonetta in her slides, and mostly for land management and uh, land use, in particular in areas like uh, forestry, agriculture, uh, urban development, but as well in areas related to uh, emergency uh, activations in case of fires or volcano eruptions, uh, just to give a couple of examples. The data policy is a full open and free data policy that is quite important, meaning that all this data can be available wide, worldwide in a full, full free and open uh, way. And as I said, it's part of the success uh, of uh, the Sentinel-2, but in general of the Copernicus, uh, of the Copernicus program. And indeed, we are launching Sentinel 2C, but Sentinel 2D is already there waiting to be launched in, in the next years uh, in order to keep this constellation up and running for, for a long time. And we're already also working and thinking about the new, the next generation that will fly after 2030. But again, to, to ensure a continuity of observation and the flow of data uh, in this uh, in this domain. I would not uh, take longer because I would like to leave more time for, for questions. We look clearly forward for a successful launch next next week. We cross finger. We uh, we are confident that everything will be will be will be fine. And with that, I, I hand over to to Stefan Estrella. Please. Thank you very much, uh, dear uh, Simonetta and dear Mauro, for uh, this uh, introduction. And uh, yes, I now uh, hand over to speak about uh, more the, the launcher and the mission. So I am uh, Stefan Israel. I am the CEO of uh, Ariane Space. Ariane Space is a launch service provider and the operator of the VV24 mission. And this VV24 mission is the 22nd and last of the Vega first generation launcher. Uh, you know that Vega has been uh, introduced in the Guyana Space Center in uh, 2012, and uh, Vega uh, has uh, already flown 21 times. Last time it was during uh, autumn for uh, uh, for uh, Taiwan and Thailand, and uh, on September 3rd it will be for the European Commission and uh, uh, ESA. So on September 3rd at 10:50 uh, p.m. local time, Ariane Space will launch Sentinel-2C, 
we have said that it is a Copernicus satellite for the European Commission within the scope of a contract with the European Space Agency. And by the way, it will be our 50th mission for the European Space Agency. This mission will place its passenger uh, into a sun-synchronous orbit at an altitude of uh, seven and seventy-five, uh, 775 kilometers. The spacecraft separation is uh, expected 57 minutes and 20 seconds after liftoff, and we expect the satellite signal acquisition uh, within 12 minutes after separation. We are really delighted uh, to start the Vega year with the European uh, Union's flagship program, uh, Copernicus, enhancing life uh, on Earth. Uh, this mission really highlights high and space commitment to space for a better life on Earth. As uh, said by Mauro and uh, Simonetta, so uh, this uh, satellite is part of the Copernicus program regarding uh, uh, Ariane Space, it will be the fifth Sentinel launched by Ariane Space, uh, knowing that uh, two previous satellites have been successfully launched with uh, Vega, Sentinel-2A in 2015 and Sentinel-2B in 2017. And Ariane Space and Vega-C have five more Copernicus launches in our order book, Sentinel-1C, uh, which is uh, scheduled on the Vega-C return to flight by the end of the year, and it shows to you that Vega and Vega-C this year will work ex in exclusivity for the Copernicus program, which I think is a very good signal when it comes to showing that uh, we are here to uh, guarantee an autonomous access to space. So we have Sentinel-1C, Sentinel-1D, Sentinel-3C, CO2MA and CO2MB, it shows how the European Commission is committed to uh, the European industry, and we really thank uh, the European Commission for its trust. The launch campaign has been running perfectly uh, well since July 12, um, and uh, we have today uh, all the indications that the launcher will be ready for the launch on September 3. The Copernicus satellite arrived in French Guiana on July 18, it was on board of the Canopy vessel, the first cell-assisted cargo ship. Uh, the fueling of Sentinel-2C has been made 16 of August. 27 of August, uh, we have made the integration of the upper composite on the launcher. You know that it is a responsibility of our partner Avio to deliver a flight-worthy uh, launcher to Ariane Space at liftoff. And for that, we will uh, assess collectively the flight worthiness uh, of the launcher during our launch readiness review, which would take place the day before the launch on September 2. And then September 3, if all the parameters are green, we will be ready for a launch. I now hand over to Tony tolkien -Nilsen. Thank you, Stefan, uh, and uh, good morning, everybody. So, um, I'm Tony Tolkien Nielsen, uh, Acting Director of Space Transportation with ESA. So, um, Vega has, as mentioned by, uh, by Stefan, uh, been a successful launcher since uh, 2012. Uh, and uh, next week we will launch the last one. Uh, Vega, uh, Vega, uh, Classic will be uh, replaced by, by Vega C. Uh, Vega C made its uh, inaugural flight in uh, July uh, 22. Uh, and unfortunately, it failed its second flight in uh, December 22 uh, due to a problem with the Sephiro 40 engine, actually, the nozzle of that engine. Uh, I can reassure you that uh, there is no commonality between uh, that failure and and, uh, and Vega. Uh, even the uh, Cephiro 40 engine is not used on uh, on Vega. Um, now uh, we have completely uh, redesigned the Cephiro 40 uh, nozzle uh, and uh, to make it much more robust. And we have made a very successful test of this. Uh, motor with the new uh, nozzle design. 
and uh, we made that test in uh, in July, and uh, there is a second test foreseen in October, uh, and there is uh, very good confidence uh, in view of the very good results we got uh, on the first test in in July, that uh, this test in 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 the beginning of October will uh, be uh, successful. Uh, so this uh, will bring us uh, on track for uh, a return to flight of Vega C uh, as of end of November. And actually, this planning has been stable since uh, since many, many months, more than a year. Uh, we have had a, a very stable situation. Uh, and we have been following a plan that was set out in the middle of last year, actually. Uh, and uh, I'm very confident that uh, we will be able to make it uh, with VKC return in uh, as of end of November. Uh, and as uh, mentioned by um, by Stefan, it will again be uh, for the service of Copernicus. Uh, it will be a, a launch of Sentinel One C, which uh, is uh, waiting for its launch. So with this, I will stop and give you some time to ask some questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tony Tolkien Nielsen. Um, so this will bring us to the end of the, the presentation and the introduction, and we will now open the floor to questions and answers. Of course, I would like to remind everyone that uh, we're recording the session as well. So. The moment you're using uh, your microphone or your camera, you're agreeing to be recorded. Please feel free to just raise your hand here uh, on the right side in the environment if you want to ask a question. But at the same time, you can also put the question here in the chat and we will give you the word in a moment. Are there any questions? The first one is always the most difficult. Any questions? It's always a compliment to the speakers. <laughs> they have answered all the questions already. So Thierry Dubois is asking me to read his question. Um, it is, is this the last Vega mission operated by Ariane Spass? Question from Thierry Dubois. So um, as uh, communicated, um, to um, the journalist at the end of July. So I saw that Thierry Dubois was aware of that. We will be uh, responsible for uh, the launches of Vega and Vega C up to uh, VV29. So we have six missions to deliver more, including uh, this one. And after <clears throat> Avio will be uh, the sole launch service provider and operator of uh, Vega. Uh, it would be Vegasi, uh, sorry. Uh, we have an order book going up to the mission 39. So uh, we will discuss with the different customers, starting with the European Commission, uh, regarding the endover of this contract in a full uh, cooperative mode. And uh, as decided by uh, the member states uh, at the end of July, Avio will start uh, the commercialization of Vega uh, early September. So Iron Space is not in charge anymore of selling and marketing Vega. However, we are fully in charge of the uh, operation of Vega up to uh, VV29, meaning six, six launches to deliver, including this one, the last Vega, and then five uh, Vega C. Thank you, uh, Stefan. Um, there is a question as well from Robert Wall. I think, Robert, you had your hand up. You took it down again. I will read your question if you agree. It's a, it's a question for, for Tony, Tony Tolkien Nielsen or Stefan Israel. Uh, does the nozzle redesign impact your payload capacity? And if so, how? And can you talk us through the planned launch cadence of the, after the Sentinel-1C mission, presuming success, of course? Um, yeah, um, actually the new design and the new material is um, very, very good. 
so we have very little erosion of uh, of the uh, of the nozzle, uh, which is actually costing uh, performance. So uh, this new nozzle design and the, the new nozzle material, the so-called carbon carbon uh, material, um, is actually improving performance. Uh, then uh, on on the question of uh, of cadence. Uh, we are planning uh, four uh, launches uh, in uh, 25 and five uh, in uh, in 26. But maybe uh, Stefan, I'm a, I'm a little bit stepping on your on your <laughs> area there. No, no, uh, you you said it, huh, Tony. So uh, uh, clearly, uh, all the partners are working uh, towards uh, four Vegasi next year. And uh, this is Richie Ball, and for sure we have uh, the customers uh, to deliver these missions. And after, uh, we would like to make, uh, and it will be the responsibility of Avio for sure, uh, five legacy per year from 2026 onwards. And it shows to you uh, that there will be a, a lot of work to deliver from the CSG because in parallel, on a steady basis, we would like to have a 9 to 11 Ariane 6. Uh, and... Uh, with uh, five uh, Vegasi. And it shows that uh, uh, under the leadership of uh, ISA uh, with uh, Ariane 6 and Vegasi, uh, Europe is now uh, organized to deliver uh, an autonomous access to space to European payloads and to uh, international um, customers. Thank you very much, uh, Robert. Please raise your hand again if you have a follow-up question to that. Uh, in the meantime, I would like to understand from Simonetta and from Mauro, first of all, Copernicus is now more than 25 years old, I think 26 this year as a program, <laughs> and has set, I think, the gold standard for, for Earth observation. Uh, could you run us through some of the achievements of the Copernicus program? Maybe Simonetta. Mauro, do you want to start? or? I start? Okay. Yes, as you say, Nina, it's been 25 years celebration last year. Of course, this is a program which is led by the European Commission, and it's a program that in terms of space component and Sentinel and satellites has been supporting priorities, which are European Union priorities in a way or another, which means it has provided really success stories in many areas, typically agriculture. The common agriculture policy, which is a super relevant policy area of the Union, in that domain, with the data from Sentinel-2, we had demonstration projects, which we were running, and then were also taken over uh, somehow in a more, more operational way by the services with the which the Commission is, is running, have been demonstrated uh, a variety, for example, of application in the agriculture sector. With Sentinel-2 data, we've been managing to map uh, the, the 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 areas which were uh, crops. We've managed to support uh, the uh, support policy in terms of subsidies in the agriculture field. We've managed to organize food security activities, which means also to look at what uh, uh, would be eventually the needs uh, related to an area. We've managed to look at uh, statistics in terms of agriculture statistics. And this is just an example in the agriculture field of the use of uh, Sentinel-2 data. Another area where it was really extremely I would say successful is the one on monitoring deforestation. In fact, as you know, there is a policy, Red, Red Plus, and a Kyoto Protocol uh, policy, which is related to deforestation and the need that today we have in the current uh, climate context to have uh, data which are beyond the borders, beyond the national borders on uh, deforestation, but also on reforestation efforts of the countries in Europe and all over the world. And Sentinel-2 data were combined in the last, uh, I would say, 15 years with Sentinel-1 data, radar data, to give uh, a dimension of the deforestation, to have uh, an overview of that phenomena in terms of evolution of a key parameter which contributes to climate. Other areas which I mentioned briefly earlier is, uh, of course, areas which were not expected, like methane monitoring. Methane has become a very, very important uh, Topic. And more recently, as I said, the, the methane emis emitters, thank you to the resolution of Sentinel-2, can be detected in terms of where they are 
in terms of location. And at the ESA, for example, we did a mapping uh, about a year and a half of, uh, a year and a half ago of the 1,800 methane emitters, and this we could do also using data from uh, Sentinel-2, and also of course combining those with data from other Sentinel mission like 5P. And as you know, methane is important in terms of looking at uh, leaks from pipelines, in terms of eventually uh, implementing relevant legislation and. Uh, a collaboration, which is the methane one, as I said, in the email context of the UN. We also look at the ground motion with Sentinel-2. So I think it's a long list of success stories in terms of application, but also a success story in terms of companies that in Europe have managed to uh, do business and do value-added products, which are very relevant. Today, the European Environment Agency is using a Sentinel-2 data together with other relevant data to do the report on the state of the environment. You can see green areas in the cities also, thank you to Sentinel-2. So many success stories, and I'm sure that Mauro will, will mention many more, but I think it's a success story both in terms of variety of application beyond its initial scope, in terms of number of users, and also in terms of supporting relevant, uh, I would say, challenges, which are citizens' challenges. If I may complement what was said by, by Simonetta, also taking uh, up what Ninja was mentioning, actually, we celebrated last year 25 years of Copernicus, meaning that we started in 98. It looks like a long time back, but actually the development of a space program is it, it's taking time. First of all, it started in 98. It was, I think, an idea of some uh, brilliant minds were said, okay, it would be useful to have an Earth observation program in, uh, in Europe. Actually, it started uh, in a small village uh, in Italy uh, along the lake. It was called the Baveno. There was a Baveno manifesto at that moment. But I have to say that after that, there was a lot of discussion, a lot of development, uh, fundraising, and, and so on. And the key moment, the milestone, I would say, is 20, 2014. 2014 was really the date where the first Sentinel was launched. So these are, were 16 years before the initial idea and really the launch of the first satellites. It looks long, but they, as, again, considering the need to develop new satellites, new service and so on, actually this time passed quite quickly. And from 2014, I think we, are, we launched more and more Sentinels, so we provided more and more services, and these were operational. What is for the future is really that actually we have to be First of all, to ensure the continuity of all this, because uh, actually the users are expecting that, and also uh, I would say I would say the world is expecting that someone is looking to the to the, to the planets in a continuous way. And second, we have also all the time to to evolve actually to make sure that the technology that is on board of these satellites is really uh, including the most up to date uh, capacities. As mentioned by by Simonetta, the progress that we had in in the last period is that instead of having let's say, data that are for space geeks in some way, actually, these data are more and more integrated in everyday life. From the European Commission side, we see that these, the data that are generated by Earth Observation and Copernicus are more and more integrating also in EU legislation and transpose also in international legislation, where you need some, some of these data that can be used in different areas, as mentioned by uh, land management, agriculture, uh, environmental compliance and all these aspects, so and deforestation, in order really to check how the policies are implemented. Eventually, what what is the effect of uh, of the the, the the mankind action on on the on the situation of our planet? Coming directly to the question in uh, in the uh, in the chat that was uh, would it help us highlight the environmental damage caused by ongoing wars? I think this is a very good question, and actually the the answer is uh, as can can have a double facet. The answer is yes, meaning that the data as they are can really give evidence about damage because you can see it's true that for the time being we are ten meter resolution, but already big damages can be identified. Maybe with a new generation we're already thinking to go down to around five meters or so on. It's under discussion, so even better. And this can be also complemented with all the data that we buy from commercial. Uh, capacity. So combining uh, optical data with Sentinel data with those, we can look into that. This was the first, the positive side of the answer. The negative side is linked to the fact what I said in the beginning. We are speaking about full open and free data, so it can it's tricky to actually to circulate data 
on war areas that are actually available to everyone because indeed the capacity is there but we don't know what can be the use for that so for this reason we are thinking for the future maybe to identify new ways beyond the full open and free data policy to distribute some of the data in a more restricted way in some particular cases like, like this where the use of information can be specific to areas that can be quite uh, quite critical Thank you, Mauro. Thank you also for already picking up that uh, the question from uh, Cinzia Boschiero from Italian uh, news agency. Um, there's a follow-up question from her, Cinzia. I know you have some issues. You say with your with your audio, um, but I'm not sure I fully understand. Maybe Mauro does. Um, are there any new future strategies to integrate into the space? I guess that means into space European policies implemented so far. You want to comment on that, Mauro? Yes, yes, but very quickly. As uh, I said before, I think uh, indeed one of the main points is that we have to ensure the continuity of the availability of the data. But beyond that, we want also to evolve. So what is in the evolution? What are we planning? I would say I mentioned three, three areas. First, uh, to look more into the resilience aspect of, uh, in general, our space capacities in, uh, in Europe. And uh, this, what, what does it mean? It's really to, uh, to protect more. Our capacities because what we learned from uh, the last uh, experience uh, with COVID, now with the war in Ukraine and so on, that actually we should not be naive. I think we have to really to protect and to be also capa capable to become independent in what, uh, in what uh, we provide. So this is the first part of the resilience. The second part of the resilience is really that the data can support our resilience capacity. Uh, so a little bit linked also to, to what I said before about the capacity to use the data in, uh, in some critical areas and so on to protect our uh, our infrastructure. And this for this reason that we are thinking for a future governmental service based on Earth's observation. But this is still uh, not there yet. So we are still in the thinking how to implement that. So resilience was the first part. Second part is more digital. Indeed, we are living in a digital world. And so we have to integrate more and more artificial intelligence uh, in what we do, high performance computing for, uh, um, processing the data that are generated by from from the data, and more cloud cap capacities because the data that are generated are huge, you know, so the amount is huge, and it has to be really distributed to the to the users uh, in in the best and more affordable way. And uh, last point, uh, so beyond the resilience and digital, is a more integration with, uh, let's say, industrial capacities because Copernicus is a public is a public finance program. But indeed, more and more, I think we have to combine the data generated by Sentinels that are publicly owned uh, 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 satellites with commercially owned satellites. Actually, this can be complementary because uh, I think they can work together. Indeed, when working with Copernicus, we don't want to compete with the commercial sector. This is the reason why we never enter into high resolution side. We let, let it to the commercial sector. But this uh, is not meaning that we are not using those very high resolution. So we have really to see how these two elements, so the commercials, the, the public side with the sentiment and the commercial side can work better and better together. Thank you very much, um, Mauro. Um, there's a follow-up question from Cinzia on, on the uh, Vega side. Uh, she again um, is looking, I think, for a statement on the uh, independent access to space for Europe. I would assume we are in this context continuing with Vega C and Ariane 6. Will it possible to, to remain to continue having this independent access to space? Question to Tony. Maybe Stefan wants to, to add. Yes, uh, thank you for the question. Let me just take the opportunity to correct what I said in the beginning. The test of the Sephiro 40 engine was not in July, it was in May, on the 28th of May. Now I'll come back to the uh, question. Indeed, um, Ion 6 and Vega C is today and will in the future guarantee Europe's independent access to space as long as necessary. And that was acted uh, by ministers in Seville in November last year, where uh, we established uh, a, an exploitation model for the stabilized exploitation of Ion 6 and Vega C. So that has been achieved. 
And in parallel, we are, uh, and there is a number of privately developed launches uh, coming up in Europe, which uh, we will use as well and open uh, competition and, and foster the growth of these uh, startups that are uh, developing uh, launch services so that in the future we will have a more we will have more competition and we will have a more resilient access to space but before this happens uh, and um, we will uh, support and and uh, maintain ion6 and vega as our guaranteed access to space i don't know whether stefan will um, but uh, again, thank you, Tony, for um, what you have precised. It's clear that uh, the commitment uh, from uh, the public sector uh, at the during the CV summit uh, is an outstanding one. And uh, I think we can say that uh, maybe Europe has never been as committed as, as it is today uh, towards launcher, towards uh, ESA developed launchers with uh, IN6 and Vega C complemented by uh, new uh, by new uh, commerce. We know that since day one, IN6 and Vegasi have been sought in full complementarity, industrial complementarity with the P120, the famous uh, common booster, and for sure, uh, commercial and capacity complementarity because the launchers are not uh, evolving on the, on the same segment. And when you take uh, institutional needs, these launchers uh, can deliver for Europe uh, all uh, what is necessary uh, in terms of uh, performance and capacity. There is something we do not do, it's human flight. But apart from human flight, when you take all the European missions, we have with IN6 and Vega C uh, a full uh, autonomous uh, access to space. When you take what will happen this year, it's quite remarkable to see that Vega and Vega C will deliver for Copernicus. Ariane 6 will deliver for the French uh, MOD uh, with a CSO3. And uh, so you see that uh, we speak here about uh, three institutional missions. And it is a perfect example on the fact that this launcher will give uh, to Europe uh, long-term uh, autonomous access to space. Thank you, Stefan. Israel, there's a follow-up question from uh, from Robert Wall, um, stating that uh, we will have an uh, an Ariane six mission before year end, and Vega C return to flight in a rather tight window. Uh, could you please address if there are any challenges in balancing that tight schedule? As he assumes, Robert Wall. No, you 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 know that uh, we can make uh, from the Guiana Space Center uh, approximately a launch uh, every two weeks. And today what is forecasted is uh, to have uh, the next uh, Vega C uh, launch by the end of November. And then we forecast to have in December uh, Ariane 6. And I do not uh, forecast uh, any conflict between uh, these two missions. Uh, we will start with Vega C and after we will have uh, Ariane 6. Um, with no difficulty, uh, we used to make uh, uh, 12 launches uh, per year from the Guyana Space Center uh, with uh, our family, and uh, we are perfectly organized with uh, our uh, partner, CNES, uh, to deliver um, a mission um, more than once a month, so there is no problem. Thank you. Um, there are Two other questions, but I would like to continue with the one from uh, Marta Meli from Sky TG24, because it is also related to launches. She is asking, can you tell us, and I think this is this is addressing ESA, uh, more about the private European launches you are betting on for the future? Tony. Yes, um, there is um, there's a number of, of privately uh, developed launches uh, that are being developed now by, by startups uh, in Germany, uh, in France, in the UK, in Spain, and in uh, also, I believe, in Italy. Uh, and uh, they are all um, working on what we call mini and micro launches. 
and uh, there will uh, there was supposed to be an inaugural flight of of uh, the first one or even two of them uh, this year. Uh, unfortunately, uh, there was a, a failure of a, a first stage test last week in uh, in uh, on a launch base in uh, in Scotland, Saxabord, uh, where uh, a stage exploded. But um, apart from that hiccup, there is uh, there is a lot of uh, things going on, and um, what uh, they all have plans of developing first a micro launcher or mini launcher, and then make the next step to uh, a, a bigger launcher uh, in order to become uh, economically viable. And this is this second step that is subject of the uh, European Launcher Challenge, where we will help uh, a few of them to uh, to develop the next step uh, of the launcher. Uh, and th th we have never seen this before in Europe uh, and uh, privately developed launches. We have had 45 years uh, with uh, ESA developed launches, uh, which has been in the beginning only IAN and since 2012 Vega, as mentioned. And now we see this, uh, this privately uh, private startups that are uh, getting uh, investors uh, to invest in, in their developments. And this is very unique. Uh, it has already started in, in, uh, in, in the States. And there is something is going on in, in China as well. Um, but um, we are very, um, I think the, the launcher sector in Europe has, uh, we were talking about a launcher sector, a launcher crisis, but actually it has never been more uh, abundant uh, than, than it is uh, today, where we uh, finally have uh, and are very close to return Vega C to flight. I'm very confident on that. And we have had a successful uh, flight of uh, Ariane. And we have all these uh, privately developed uh, launches uh, with, uh, with uh, young engineers uh, in very dynamic teams that are all working on launches. So um, it's a very abundant uh, sector uh, today. Thank you for elaborating. Uh, Tony Tolka Nielsen, uh, European Space Agency. There's a question from Julian Reichel from the Augsburger Allgemeine on, on Earth observation. Don't think it's specifically related to Sentinel 2C, but if he, he is wondering if it's possible to detect mines from space with Earth observation technologies. So, Sentinel 2C, as you say, Nina, uh, thank you for the question, is not really the best tool as it's optical. Uh, we had some. Uh, uh, projects which were more, I would say, research projects, demonstration projects in the past, trying to use radar instruments to detect mines. It's not certainly an operational area where we are working, but uh, radar eventually, rather than optical, would be the technology to be further pursued in that domain. Thank you. And then uh, I think there's a last question from uh, Cinzia Boschiero. Um, she's wondering about gender equality opportunities. Uh, she's uh, she is asking a question in regards to research teams in these projects. And I know there are many, many, many projects uh, related to the Copernicus program. But maybe Simonetta, you want to elaborate on this a bit for ESA and then uh, Mauro for for the European Commission. Gender Thank equality. You, Nina. Uh, diversity is overall one of the uh, strategic objectives of the agency. Uh, diversity also including in terms of gender, but not only. Today we have a situation in the agency where we have about 30% women working at ESA, 20% uh, in the top management position and aiming at more. We always work based on best competences. And what we do, we try to promote uh, with uh, the interaction that we have with uh, the education setup, the academia uh, work. Um, I would say we, we try to promote uh, that the, the offerings in the agency and in the context of space in general allow for everybody, of course, to, to come. But you need the best uh, competence, as I said, and we try to enhance 
very much the motivation of all young people, including women, through the collaboration with courses, education activities, and uh, promotion of what we do today. Uh, I would say space is a sector which is in an increasing trend, particularly Earth Observation has very good increasing trends uh, in terms of perspectives, uh, commercial perspectives. Uh, we have recently an aerospace dossier that was prepared and we have uh, some, uh, you know, uh, indicators about uh, the potential of this domain. So I think there's uh, room for everybody and certainly diversity is part of one of our uh, strategic agenda objective in the agency. Yes, if I mean the, the same, the same applies for us. I think is a general policy across the uh, European Commission in order to foster uh, a better balance uh, in, uh, in representation. Uh, if I may, already the, the 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 presence of Simonetta here is already demonstrated that the world is changing. And uh, just just to be clear, I mean I know Simonetta since a long time. Uh, Simonetta is not there because. She's a woman. She's there because she deserved that. I mean, she demonstrated, and this is meaning that in the end, I think uh, uh, already we see a change. Uh, also, in my team, for example, fifty percent of, more or less, of uh, the, my, my colleagues are, are women, and and we have I've seen that really increasing over uh, over the years. And as we are dealing with different entities, not just ESA, but for example, uh, ECMWF, uh, European Maritime Agency, and so on. Even there, the director or director general, so over the time became uh, became women. So I think that is really demonstrating the fact that this kind of uh, uh, mentality of gender balance is really coming into into the place, but not because it is imposed, because it's naturally coming. And I think this is a really good point about that. And and if I may, to complement on the iron space side, we have now uh, four uh, women at our uh, executive uh, committee, and uh, we are very uh, proud of that because uh, I think uh, gender diversity is absolutely key in our uh, industry. So I think we all uh, around this table uh, share the same goal uh, regarding uh, gender diversity. Thank you very much. Um, I think this brings us to the end of this uh, pre-launch uh, media briefing. Um, I would like to thank very much the journalists that were joining us today. Uh, I see there's a lot of thank you in the chat as well. If there are any additional questions uh, from the side of the journalists or those listening in, you can, of course, uh, address them with us afterwards. You can find us at media at ESA.int. And with this, a very warm welcome to the speakers. And uh, thank you very much for all of you for participating. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much to all. Thanks a lot.